Hey, it's Chronologically Gaming, the only channel that's perpetually retro because we're playing every video game in order of release, blazing a trail where no one has gone before. Welcome to April 1982. We're still in the beginning of April and we last played Omotasando Adventure, our very first computer game from Japan on the PC-88. Let's press forward and see our next game. We're next back in North America on the Apple II and this is People Pong. What is People Pong? I know what Pong is, but if you add people to it, uh, let's see what happens. This one we have a few screenshots for and not the actual box. So let's pop it and play some People Pong, at least in the beginning of April 1982. Thank you for all the crackers out there for getting us People Pong. Prepare yourself. I don't know if I prepared for this. It's probably just another Pong clone, right? Okay, there we go. People Pong. We can play with keyboard or paddles. I got a paddle on. Uh, let's put the paddle on our Apple II and let's go. Paddle is in. All right, it's it's at the bottom of the screen, moving the paddle left and right. And I'm just bouncing people around. Are those real people? And it looks like they're ricocheting off the walls too. This would be 1982 ragtime physics. Oh, and the walls are getting shorter now. And we're going faster. Oh my gosh. They just got imp it's a, it's real people. They just got impaled at the bottom of the screen. <laughs> what? What I wasn't ready. Oh my gosh. Oh um, look at that. And they got blood dripping down. What is going on? People pong is You're actually taking people and you're bouncing people around using Pong. Who in the world? Now, how many kids played this one back in 1982 and the... Oh, my gosh. And the parents didn't realize how violent the game was. It is. It's Death Pong. We did have some of the cards when we played Circus on the Atari 2600 because you're bouncing around clowns or um, acrobats on trapezes. And so they would land on the ground and kind of crunch in. But this is taking it to a whole nother level. And look, they're 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 flying around as if <laughs> if it's real people. That is ridiculous. <laughs> oh, and if you hit the birds, it bounces off the end, so that's not good. I'm not really doing a great job saving these people playing pong. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh, that's so terrible. <laughs> Now, does this make you want to play the game to help save the people even more? Like, I have to make sure my pedal moves correctly or these people are going to die. Or does it make you want to mess up more so you see more people die in the game? I guess it depends on what kind of video game play... Oh, I thought I got him that time. It's also keeping an account on the left side, and I don't know what, those, what that means. The walls were closing in, and, and we didn't have a manual for this one or back of the box. So here, I'm interested to see what the description is for this. So you control a small platform that you move left and right over a field of sharp spikes. They continually bounce a woman above the spikes to prevent her from falling into a spiky death. That's true, it's a woman. Woman's bounce, she'll fly at flying birds, balloons, and occasionally float by. The walls of the level slowly close in on the player, increasing the challenge until the player has nowhere left to move and the new level will begin. Total of five areas. Okay, so that's pretty much what we're doing. We're, we've done it. We've seen what People Pong is. The carnage of People Pong. So does this mean they're running out of ideas for Pong by 1982? Or Pong has just begun? Oh, I thought I had her that time. Oh man. Well, I can't say I've seen it all until I've actually seen it all. There you go, that was People Pong. I'm not really sure how to rate that one. Is it average? Is it something that's the usual game you'd see in 1982? I'd say no, but it's not like we're breaking new ground on gameplay. It's it's pretty much just Pong, and they just add people in there. Uh, so I'm going to say, because of the content, uh, two and a half stars for people Pong. <laughs> so we'll do just below the average range. Yeah, that's pretty bizarre. Let's see what our next game is. We're now still on the Apple II. This is Pest Patrol. Let's take a look at Pest Patrol, starting with the box. That is some very bizarre front of the box. An actual zoomed-in fly. 
going in for a creepy look. Looks like this needs 48K. Why? Why do you need 48K to play pest control? <laughs> yes, right? Maybe we get puppy pong at some other time. All right, let's flip it over in the back. For every pesky insects that ever bothered you, you owe it to yourself to play Pest Patrol. Bomb the bugs and have uh, and have them bomb you as you encounter armored snails, butterfly fighters. Okay, is it Centipede then? Are we playing a Centipede variant? Pest Patrol offers a never-ending challenge from so many different insects that you better not blink while you play. It could be fatal. They bounce, bite, bomb their way toward you in wave after wave of insect invasions. Can you survive 29 levels? of swarming, stinging, and strafing insects, or suffer the injury of infestation. Find out as you play Pest Control by Sierra Online. That's right. What other artwork do we have for Pest Patrol? We have the box. <laughs> well, we have the manual cover. We don't have the actual manual, but we have the advertisement. The game's not... The game's got bugs, but you'll love them. We'll be the judge of that. I don't know about Pest Patrol. Let's pop in and play some Pest Patrol, released at the beginning of April 1982. What's going to happen with Pest Patrol? Another one that was fully cracked. Wouldn't be able to run it without you crackers out there. Thanks so much. We want to play some Pest Patrol. Now, if it's by Sierra, I already have high hopes. I'm expecting something fun, good, high quality. So this was cracked by Mr. Crackman. Thanks, Mr. Crackman. And looks like we got uh, controls left and right, fire and stop. So this one probably is just going to continue to move in one direction. And keep point of all, all those points there. You got to know those in 1982, how to play them. Or else, what's the point? Why, why are you playing if you don't have the points? Oh, it's going in a track mode, like an arcade game. It's a shooter. Sweet. All right, well, I'm going to play. Let's go back to the main menu. That's uh, D and F, J and K. All right, so we're in. Controls do work correctly. Yeah, it's very good, responsive gameplay for a home computer in 1982 on the Apple. Feels good. As usual, sound is not incredible, and we don't really see the best sound on the Apple II. It's about the gameplay, man. <laughs> I shot, I swear I shot that snail. Oh, if you die, all the enemies just fall down to the bottom of the screen? Okay. And I'm also playing as a can right now. It says I have a, a few cans left for lives, like three cans. Now, I'm digging the way the game plays because the enemies are doing a variant we haven't seen. They haven't seen them fly around the screen like this or making loop-de-loops. Oh, okay, the snail is, like, blocking. What? I don't know what I hit that time. So the snail is like the barrier in Space Invaders, either to protect you or keep you from shooting the enemies. Here's the thing, though. This is only controlled with keyboard. I tried paddles, and I tried the joystick. Doesn't work. So it's only keyboard controlled. I'd say that's a little bit lower than the usual games we've seen on the Apple II. But, I mean, look at the homage for uh, Phoenix. We have a bird that's flapping on the left side. I don't even think... Okay, I can't kill that. Oh, they dropped something that I can't hit. That's what I died from. It dropped... Looks like an egg that smashed on the ground and then stuck to the ground. Okay, those are just bombs falling down. Not too bad. And it's the, ooh, looks like three shots at a time, which is better than the use when we see for Space Invaders. Okay, so I got to watch that. They're going to pinch something down, and I can't, yeah, there it is. So they still bomb the sides. Oh, gosh, and they got a spider that bounces now? Okay. So I cannot go. Oh, <laughs> I knew that was going to happen. It almost reminds me of Tempest, the way it was bringing an enemy that's really close to the barrier that you can uh, that you can go go to. Great arcade game for 1982 on the home computer. Yeah, the, the keyboard controls would I'd say would be the only downfall to it. Let's get that spider before it comes down. No, you don't. No. Oh my gosh, it's still. The other thing that's a little interesting is when we play games that have where enemies take multiple shots, I'm expecting you know one shot, one kill by 1982. And whenever enemies take a few shots, almost like a bullet sponge, it's a little not as uh, not not as fun as when you think your your shots are doing something effective to the enemy. But the controls are when I move to the left, it continues to move to the left constantly until I push the stop button, which is a separate one. So it's almost like uh, it drifts, or you feel like you're drifting nonstop in the game. 
Oh my gosh, you dropped multiple? Yeah, and it's for the pros only. This is very, very difficult. <laughs> After going from people pong to this one, it almost feels like this game is not violent enough. But I mean, think of all the violent video games we've seen from 1982. I can, I think there's only two, two or three that are actually violent. Uh, it's still not going out. Maybe you can't get that spider until it drops on the floor. There we go. Okay, knocked him out. All the bottoms cleared. What do they got next? Okay, we got different changes of enemy type, or the enemies moving in a different move area, and then they are dro they're dropping the mines that stick on the ground again. And how far can you get? Looks like it brings me back a level whenever I die. There we go. So I'd say, even though it's not using joystick controls, it's still about standard for the games we played. It, this would have been better if it had joystick controls, and the way you move left and right wouldn't drift as far. But I'll still say three stars. It's it's an average game for 1982. Of all the games we've seen thus far. And with that, let's press forward and see our next game. Next, we're going to England to play the ZX81. This is the Pharaoh's Tomb. Yeah, it does. We're squirting toothpaste at the top. That's it. Yeah, it's bug spray. And we pl played this bug spray before, I believe. All right, let's pop in the Pharaoh's Tomb. This is by Mike Farley. Way to go, Mark. Published by Phipps Associates, and it's still in April. Here we go. The Pharaoh's Tomb. Your task is to collect treasures and find the return them to the Oasis. So we're talking text adventure game, just like Colossal Cave Adventure. It's a long game. You may save it on tape when you want to quit. Oh, my gosh. Now, think about it. The ZX81, you plugged in the cassette tape. So that means if you wanted to save it, you would have to switch out the cassette tape to uh, save the game. Very, very cumbersome on the ZX81. So guide me with short sentences. I don't know what's going to happen. What if I do if I type look? Whoa! Okay, it's refreshing the screen every time I type a letter. That's not the huge. We've seen a few games in the ZX81 do this. I'm in the Oasis in the desert. There's a mountain slope here. A path goes north. There's also a box of matches. We'll get... Oh my gosh, every letter matches... Whoa, it's like playing something from the Dark Ages to play a text adventure game. And look at the load, load time. By the way, we're playing on a uh, uh, overly powered or higher memory ZX81 than you would have had at this time. And it still takes that long to load. Oh man, I'm in the Oasis in the desert. There's a mountain slope here. A path goes north. Okay, so it's, it's your bare bones text adventure game. I'm not going to go any further because of the flashing. I'm going to say that's, that's really the, the worst part of it. Not, not even just the loading. We can deal with loading in 1982, but the redrawing the screen after every letter, gosh. Yeah, it blacks out. Uh, I'm going to say I'm going to have to go broken because those poor kids in England. Uh, I, I hope your eyesight's okay. Well, I mean, by now at least. Let's say one star, so it's in the broken range. The Pharaoh's Tomb. Ugh. We play better text adventure games, that's for sure. And with that, let's press forward and see our next game. <laughs> Get the disco ball out. We're now on the Atari home computer. This is Poker Tourney. Let's play some poker. Another one we don't have a box for. Let's pop in and play Poker Tourney and see where it leads us. This is by Jerry White. Way to go, Jerry. Published by Artworks. In the past, when we play games by Artworks, they usually have it blazoned on their box. Artworks, Artworks, Artworks everywhere. All right, what's your name? We are Chrono. This is compiled using A, B, C. With the address they had was once before. Let's see what Jerry did for Poker Churney. If it's anything to shine about. Oh, we're already in. We're playing a game. Nice. Okay, we got uh, O2 pair. Love it. So it looks like the people we're playing with is the man. <laughs> the man. Cincinnati Kid. Lakewood Louie. Shifty Pete. Stoneface. Chrono. What do you want to do? We can bet, raise. They open for five. No way. This uses the... It does... We plugged in the Atari VCS joystick, and it works. Uh, red button. Raise. Yeah. Oh, this is an easy with play poker game if it uses the Atari joystick. How many cards do you want to discard? Uh, let's do just one. Hope for the... Oh, this is great. Yeah, this is playing with the joystick, so I can just select it with the arrow. And then red button. Come on, give me the full house. No full house. And you can see it's really fast to play too. Okay, let's just go ahead and do uh, raise. Let's go. Let's go high. Oh, they're the same ones that did that one too. I believe we'll be seeing that in the future. So press trigger to continue. This one works really, really well. Um, let's see what they got. 
and trigger. We win it. Do we see what they have, though? They didn't. I don't think they showed us. DLR. Okay, so we go to the next one. So really, really simple, but the way that it controls with the Atari VCS joystick, that's the, the kicker right there. Playing a computer game with a great joystick is always the best. Nobody opened, so new hand will be dealt. Okay, so nobody cared. I think I passed. I didn't even open. <laughs> uh, at this point, Hold'em isn't popular. This one is... Uh, every game we're going to be playing, uh, as poker games go, it's going to be draw or stud, and that's it. I don't think we're going to see a Hold'em game until the 90s. <laughs> yeah, and we're going to see that a lot when it does show up. You, you, you make one really good computer game, and then it gets passed on every single computer out there. Yeah. People Pong, though, uh, even though I said it was sub-average just because of gameplay, that was the eye-opener. Like, hey, you ready to see some people get impaled on sticks? Yeah, that's so fun. Okay, so uh, we won't go any further with poker. Th this is a great game of poker. I'm going to say, even though it, if it's not your thing to play, it's still it, they, they did it very well. So I'm going to do three and a half stars for Poker Tourney. And considering all the games you could play at this point, and think of all the people that wanted to play poker. And all you got to do is the Atari joystick to do all the commands. Not even have to use the, the keyboard. That's great. All right, so that's Poker Tourney. Having some fun. Yeah, I think it's 90... Well, uh, I, I, I'll, I'll see. I, I always say something because I think in the future, whatever is going to be in video games, but I'm way wrong when it comes to the channel because once I start playing the games in order, then I get schooled. So I'm not going to say anything. We'll just see when we see the first Texas Hold'em game. And with that, let's press forward and see the next game. <laughs> the next game is Pong. All right, you know what? I'm going back. People Pong, you get bumped up. If we have a normal Pong, then People Pong gets uh, higher than that. We're going to go uh, three and a half stars. I'm going to say People Pong is an above average game because it is not the typical Pong game. And let's see what normal Pong is like on the Commodore VIC-20. It's 1982. Why are we getting normal Pong still? All right, this one, this one just has a few screenshots for us again. And this one is going to be requiring a paddle. Let's pop it and play Pong. Actually, let's type it and play Pong. This is by Compute Magazine, a type-in game in the beginning of April 1982. Let's play. Welcome to Vic Pong. Do we want to play the Vic? Oh, you can play another player. Okay. So this one requires paddles, a type-in game that requires paddles for your Vic 20. So I'm pushing number one and then putting our name in quite a bit tonight. And we're not in the arcade. So player one will do Chrono. <laughs> yes, I, I would say so. If, if, if anything can top people pong, then I might rate it above three and a half, three and a half stars. Okay, how hard are we going to play? Let's go seven. If nine's impossible, we'll see how impossible it is. Oh my gosh, no. Okay, well, bear in mind, this is a typing game, but I'm using the paddle, and the paddle usually runs really well. But gosh, tile-based? Look at this. That's me moving as quick as I can. We play way better paddle games than the VIC-20, too. It has, it has a good paddle. Think of the game we played, which was one of the first home versions. Oh, that's just me not, not responding. One of the first home versions we did of Avalanche. It was really good. Played really well. Oh, but I see my... Yeah, that's so slow. Oh, gosh. No, no, no. No, no, no. We played way better. I know 1982 can do better than that. So we're going to say bad for Pong. Uh, sorry, and it's not People Pong. Even People Pong played sm smoother than that. Uh, I'm going to say one and a half stars for just Pong. And the other thing, too, is how much mileage could you get from just Pong by 1982? We've seen a lot of things here on the channel, and I don't think Pong can cut it. Oh, you're going one? Yeah, I can see that, too. All right, there's Pong. Let's press forward and see our next game. We're next back on the Atari home computer. This is Probe 1, the transmitter. So for this one, we have a few interesting front of the box. This is by Synergistic Software. They call it an action adventure. It's pretty much just graphic adventure, if what we would translate it as. But look at that. The front box is really impressive. Sci-fi themed. That's got to be us in the front. Kicking it with some futuristic clothes on a distant planet, multiple moons. Love it. Flip it over in the back. And then a high-res action game is how they, they describe it. You're the commander of the Terran Confederation scout ship Probe 1. You've been sent to a newly developed matter transmitter to Terra before it can fall into the hands of the Drelgan Hegemony. 
man, the lore just gets greater and greater here. The device is only the only hope for human race is, has of averting extinction in their war with the Drelgans. Oh my gosh, they're already popping all kinds of things in. <laughs> that is true. The, what we played was pr pretty standard for basic games. That's, that, that is correct. A quick mind and fast reflexes are required to successfully search the dangerous unmanned research center. You must fight off the 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 uh, guard robots. It says card robots using paddler joystick controls as well as keyboard commands. New layouts and hazard locations as well as multiple levels of skill ensure a fresh challenge game after game. So there you go. Paddle or joysticks you can use on this one. Let's take a look at the artwork we have for oh advertising flyer. This one is Synergistic Software, which also has Crisis Mountain and Warlock's Revenge. Don't think we've seen those those yet. With a few other software, if you don't want video games. Well, we only want video games here. Probe 1, The Transmitter. New high-res adventure with arcade action. So cool. All right, let's pop in and play some Probe 1, The Transmitter. The beginning of April, 1982. This is by Lloyd D. Allman Jr. Way to go, Lloyd. And Synergistic Software is our publisher. What's going to happen? After just playing poker on Atari, and I just love the Atari because if you go for your v VCS, you, have, you play some Space Invaders or something, you unplug the joystick, plug in your Atari, and it works just great. Okay, so we got space opening. Oh, intro cinematic. Nice. They've been playing with that sound on the Atari 8-bit for a lot, a lot of games we played, and they're just getting better and better. The slow fade in, that's us coming in. I wonder if we're putting our name in for this one as well. Yeah, the front cover did look sharp. It looked like something from the 50s. I dig it. All right, there we are. We're in. How do we start this thing? The transmitter. We are Pro 1. I mean, look at the high-res graphics, though. It's a nice aesthetic, making you feel like you're in a space game. Okay, reaction time. So maybe this is a slightly action game, then. Now, usually when we see a graphic adventure and ask for reaction time, the, the games we play is like Adventure to Atlantis. And that's all it's saying is when someone attacks, before you type the command, how fast are you going to react to type it in? So it's not like an action, like a, a shooter game. It's more how fast can you type in. We'll just do slowest. We're pretty slow here. And then we want joystick, for sure. You have the following, a stun gun and a translator to translate the Drelgan Empire. Please be patient. The screen will blank during the walk to the city. All right, so everyone be patient. Go get a drink. If it's 1982, by this point, we waited a long time for some of the loading games. And uh, if it says to be patient, that's usually a bad sign. All right, so I'm fast forwarding now. We'll go make a sandwich. Hang out with some loved ones and then come back to the game and maybe it'll load. Maybe it won't. Wow. Now I'm fast forwarding. This is, oh, wait, we have response. The screen is going multicolor with the disco ball, but there's no sound. What is this? This is taking way too long to load. We're, we're, we're going at 800% faster than the usual and it's still loading. 800% and it's still loading. <laughs> Oh yeah, uh, I, I the but this era of gaming, I didn't even experience this kind of loading. Uh, but I remember waiting on uh, you know you know you know pin, uh, before the Pentium uh, came out and uh, waiting for games to load and going getting sandwiches or drinks. Sometimes I even get a whole meal and then come back and play the level I wanted to play. It's still loading. Something's going wrong. This is not correct. This is eight hundred percent faster than usual. And it, oh my gosh, no. I don't believe it. Okay, so that's that's the longest we've ever had to wait on 800% the, the speed of loading. So sadly, I got to give Pro 1 a one star. Maybe we can find a better copy or another version of Pro 1 that'll work. But in, in the meantime, I'm sorry, Pro 1. We must press forward. Yes, go to the arcade. <laughs> that's a great idea. After you play, after you exhaust all your home systems and you played all of them and the game still doesn't load, then go to the arcade, play some games, and then come back. That's my, what, what we need for Pro 1. Uh, sadly, it's probably not just the loading. It's just the game itself either has a disc issue or a, a problem uh, c connecting. So we might try a cassette and come back to it at some point. So just to bear in mind, we're going from game to game on the live stream. Uh, and as we go from game to game, we don't know what's going to happen for the, the, the game itself to come up. Because there, there's there's so many things that can happen on the, the dump that comes online for people that uh, submit these games. 
And then we also don't know, uh, for, uh, it takes a lot of research to actually get the games to pop up and load themselves. But then even after the game's up, we don't know what's next. So for example, this game, I saw the intro and I'm like, okay, we got the game up, we're, we're good to go. I saw the, the, the ship and I'm like, okay, we can go on the live stream. I had no idea what the next loading was going to be. And then it also includes games that they may start the load sequence and then you have to flip the disc over and then find out if that's going to work. Yeah, who knows? <laughs> All right, so let's see what our next game is. If you got any help that you want to give me for Probe 1, we may check it out at a later time. Our next game is back in England on the ZX81. This is Scion Backgammon. Scion Backgammon. We are, will never escape the Backgammon games. Mark my words. We need 16K for this one, and we open up the sleeve for the entire cassette. It shows you Backgammon on one side, and then, oh, it has the example of the Backgammon board. But, I mean, it's backgammon. Why are there so many? Uh, maybe it's because it's just a very simple game to play for a strategy game. There's the cassette tape for Scion Backgammon. And we can flip it over on the back. Yeah, it looks like this is two different cassettes we could load. Or, uh, I'm sorry, flipping the cassette over on both sides. Oh my gosh, you're right, yeah. By the way, when we get to Mahjong, because we haven't seen a lot of games from Japan at this point in time, when we do get to the Mahjong games, we'll, we're going to be missing out on some. Or it'll be, there's the flash of a Mahjong game, and then we move to the next one. Because I am not going to be booting up and playing Mahjong. There is way too much. There, there is more than you would ever expect. I know you can expect a lot, but there's more than that. All right, so for this one, we have another version, which is also Backgammon, by Keith Archer. So uh, props to Keith, who also did Backgammon in 1982. But let's play some Scion Backgammon, the beginning of April 1982. Is it because it was easy to load? Is that why? All right, so on the ZX81, we run, and then new line, and then we're in. What skill level do we want? We're going hard, four, and we want fast. Change the skill level? No, we're ready. Go. And this is all I'm going to show you. Is Scion Backgammon has the dice on each side. You roll the dice for who, if it's you playing against the computer. And I think you can only play against the computer. So there is no two-player mode. And then this is the, what the board looks like. Move your pieces around. You have a great time playing Backgammon on the ZX81. Of all the games we've seen to this point, it's really not how well Backgammon's programmed. It's do you want to play Backgammon? at this point in 1982. And some people, yes, uh, if, it, if it runs really well and plays really well. On the ZX81, I'm still going to say bad. Two stars for Scion Backgammon. It's not broken. It's Backgammon. Oh, yes. Oh, that's true. Some of them uh, later on, like the one you're referring to, Casey, Casey Club Kirby, uh, yes, are, are playable. I'm talking back in the 80s Mahjong. You haven't seen Mahjong till you played it in the 80s. Oh, man. It's a whole new world. <laughs> and with that, let's press forward and see our next game. We're back on the Atari home computer. This is Renaissance. What is Renaissance, you may ask? Well, this one is another one. No box, just a few screenshots for it. Let's pop in and play Renaissance in the beginning of April 1982. Developed by Louis X. Savane. Way to go, Louis. And UMI is the publisher for this one. United Microware Industries, I believe. All right, so I'm putting, sweet. I pushed the red button on the VCS joystick and it works. Yeah, and we're playing Othello. Why do they call it Renaissance? No one's gonna buy it if they want. Well, I guess you could buy it if you think it's gonna a game about the Renaissance. All right, so once again, we're putting in our name. All right, so I'm gonna play as black. What level do we want? Let's go five. Does five work? Oh, cool. It runs with the joystick. So I'm using my VCS joystick, pushing the red button. Eh? Right here? Yeah. It works. So the computer then takes its turn. And I believe this is another one, not two players, which is so bizarre. On the VCS, we've already seen Othello with two player capability. We've seen Othello on a few home computers besides the, or and consoles. So Othello's been out there for a while, but why make this one only one player? Or reverse whatever you would want to call it. All right, so our turn. But this one does use the VCS joystick, but it's only one player, so you only play against the computer. Well, there you go. That's uh, that's Renaissance. Kind of gives you an idea of what it is. It's uh, Othello or reverse Now, as it only being one player, I'm going to go subpar. We've seen better versions, so two and a half stars for Renaissance. And again, it's how do you how much do you want to play a, a board game in 1982? And then we also have Renaissance for the Commodore VIC-20. 
the obviously better port of Renaissance, right? Much better box. At least it tells you what's going on. Why did they put Leonardo da Vinci on the front of the box for Renaissance? Eight levels of play. I believe this one is two players, not uh, the, uh, the, the the last one we played. Yeah, it's just Othello. Renaissance hails the rebirth of this fascinating strategy game. By 1982, everyone was clamoring for more Othello. And the other versions are multiple versions on uh, on cartridge. So we're going to pop in the cartridge to our Commodore VIC-20. It's the beginning of April 1982. And still ported by Louis X. Savane. Way to go, man. <laughs> That's exactly what he's thinking on the front of the box. All right, so this one is, again, press any key to start. Oh, it's doing an attract mode. It's going automatically playing and showing you how do you play Renaissance. Notice that the game and the box don't have any mention of Othello or Reversi. It's like they're, they're, they're claiming this is a new game. This is Renaissance is something fresh and new. But there is no variation to this versus Othello or Reversi. It's, it's the exact same game. All right, so we're in. First name. Black or white, we're going black. Don't go back. Level is five this time. And does it use? It does. So uh, the Commodore VIC-20 joystick works for this. Props again. But again, not two player. So Renaissance is single player only. Maybe Renaissance is going for, let's make a really challenging version of Othello. So that the, the pros have something really good they can play. Yeah, they could, right? It's the exact same color pieces. Now, I want to look at the box again. Did the box really say anything? Renaissance, pop popular capture, no, nothing. There, there's nothing that says this is Othello. So if uh, you didn't have any screenshots, you wouldn't even know what you were doing. But I'll still say the same. It's subpar. Two and a half stars for Renaissance on the Commodore VIC-20. All right, let's press forward and see our next game. We're still on the Commodore VIC-20, and William Shatner is selling the Commodore VIC-20. The better system, apparently. This is Rescue from Nufon on the Commodore VIC-20. This one is another one, no box, no screenshots. And if we try to play this one, I cannot get this sucker to load. The tape does not work for me. So if you got a good tape of Rescue from Nufon, I'd love to check it out. It doesn't load, sadly. Sad face. But if you take a look at the, the artwork, we have what looks like a top-down adventure game similar to Adventure on the VCS. So I really want to check this one out. Hopefully we can get this one to run or play in the future if you have a good tape from it. In the meantime, we're going to have to say one star for Rescue from Nufon. Was it good? Was it terrible? We'll never know. And let's continue on playing our next game. We're uh, still on the Commodore VIC-20. This is Roadrunner. Let's see what Roadrunner is all about. No box again for this one. Just a few screenshots. We're playing some Roadrunner. This is by Titan Programs at the beginning of April 1982 for the Commodore VIC-20. Yes, yeah, so sad. I don't like it when the games do not run themselves, but when you're playing every game, you can't expect everything to work. But this one will, right? Go. Found Roadrunner. Yes, it did. All right, so we have joystick to move. Press any key to play. Oh, except don't put any key on the joystick. Put, use the keyboard. All right, we're in. Oh, gosh, it flashed across the screen. I thought we are going to die. Okay, so I'm on the right side as an alien. It's <laughs> it's Crossy Road from 1982. Oh, gosh, yeah, I thought I had to go through it that fast. But you're, you're, you're essentially just trying to make it from one side to the other. Don't get run over by the aliens now. Nice and easy. Wait, did I die, or am I alive? What? I got zero score for that? Why? Oh, I know why. Because you can move... Oh, I see. You can move up and down. I was expecting it to be like... The, the, the space travel game from the 70s, where you can only move in one plane. But you have to move up and down, and then go to the, the, the end, and then collect points over on the far left side. Okay, I see. So Roadrunner, uh, I'm not even playing as a Roadrunner. It'd be cooler if they did that. Make it cutesy, you know, character called the Roadrunner. Yeah, so you can move left and right, back and forth. There we go. So we finally got some points for Roadrunner. Taking a little bit of tropes from Frogger, maybe? Oh gosh, it's already moving up on speed. No, 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 no. But this is using the Commodore VIC-20 joystick, so it... Gosh, okay, yeah, frantic, 
tile-based, but well-done tile-based programming. Looks good. <laughs> the sound effects, though, no, they're more... Oh, I can even move diagonal. Okay, so it, it is an eight-way digital joystick for the Commodore VIC-20, and so I'm, I didn't realize I could do that. Most of the games I've... Let's see if I can do it again. Here, yeah, look, I can weave myself around. Okay, yeah, so better controls than I thought. I'm able to move across to the other side. Oh, yeah, so it... Why did I die? Did I touch the middle? I think you have to touch the actual number nine for that to work. All right, so this is actually all right. For uh, the Commodore VIC-20, for a simple game idea, it works really well. Using the joystick, all you got to do is get from one side to the other. Great arcade gameplay. Yep. Yeah, and I, I understand, figured out a little bit better how it plays. All right, Roadrunner, that's all right. That's all right. I'll say three stars for Roadrunner. It's a good time. Pretty average for 1982. And fun to play. I don't know why they call it Roadrunner, though. It's, it's more like something sci-fi. Uh, sci All right, after Roadrunner, where are we going now? Here we go. We're on the Apple II, and this is Saga Number 1, Adventureland. So before we go into this, Saga Number 1, Adventureland is just a remake of the original Adventureland by Scott Adams. He had a text-only adventure game that he made called Adventureland. Started the whole series that we've been trekking through and playing everything on the series by Scott Adams. And then now in 1982, this is the very first time he remade it. So it's one of the first times we've seen a remake of a game, like a, a, a remastered or redone version of a game ever. Uh, this one right here. So they took the original text on the game and he turned it into a graphic adventure game, putting graphics in it. It's called the Scott Adams Graphic Adventure or the Saga. And this is number one Adventureland. Now this one's special because the first time we ever played Adventureland on the channel, I played the wrong version. I played this version of Adventureland, which was incorrect. The, the first one, obviously, was the text only. So the one I played was the one that had Scott Adams giving a public service announcement of don't copy pirate software or don't use pirate software. And the game it ended up not even running at all. It didn't even work correctly. And so now we're here in 1982 with the correct version of Adventureland when it came out. And this one's special because it uses the Votrax voice synthesis system this would play the adventure game and read off the adventure game to you so i don't know if you can hear in the background i put a video clip in because it was so slow to hear the votrax sound uh it didn't run smoothly in the game for the live stream but here's what it sounds like the votrax system everyone should know if you were from the 80s in this adventure you were to find treasures store them away to see how well you were doing safe and I know what everyone's thinking, uh, it's uh, Stephen Hawking talking to them. So if your dream of playing adventure games with Stephen Hawking talking to you, then the Votrax voice synthesis system is for you. So let's take a look at the box for Saga number one, the Scott Adams graphic adventure, the first of its kind, Adventureland. So when we first saw this, I was a little confused because it didn't have a, like a classic adventure game aesthetic. And now I understand why, because it's supposed to be 1982. Yes, that's true. And you've probably heard that sound effect or talking that sounds that way on lots of other systems. Because th it, it was not just for the Apple II. This was other home computers and then even other systems or toys that you played at the time as well. <laughs> no, we don't have to see the message. I was going to skip by the message so we can actually see the game. But we've, we've seen the public service announcement. It's great. It is hilarious. All right, so there's the front of the box for the new Adventureland. Very out of place. You got some, like, 80s chick with uh, ripped shorts and uh, a, a tube top in the middle of a fantasy Adventureland. I guess if that's your fantasy. So we flip it over on the back, and they show the picture at the top advertising, this is the cool part. This is the best part of the Scott Adams graphic adventure. It's no longer text only. Uh, this is the audio version. This version is the one that ha that, that worked with the Votrex voice system. So the top of the, the, the back of the box gives us a few screenshots of what you see. This package is jam-packed with full programming, compressed high-resolution pictures drawn using a special palette of over 100 colors. So it's better than high resolution. And it also supports the Votrax voice synthesizer, giving you full color adventure that talks. So we played one other talking adventure game on the channel. This is the very first color talking adventure game that you could play. 
You wander through the enchanted world trying to recover the 13 lost treasures. You'll encounter wild animals, magical beings, and other perils and puzzles. Can you rescue the blue ox from the quicksand or find your way out of the maze of pits? Happy adventuring. Oh, oh no. Uh, the Votrex is only working for the game itself. Good point. You cannot hear Scott Adams talking or Stephen Hawking's voice talking doing the public service announcement. No, sorry. It's only the game itself. That's the only part that it reads. <laughs> That'd be pretty cool, though. And then over here on the side, every adventure international game has the back of the box information. A little hard to see here. Let me see if we can see it better here. Flip it over. Yeah, there it is. They show the program parameters, how it was programmed in. It still says one month for this one. And you got to be 12 years old to play Adventureland? What? No, can't be that, right? That, that can't be correct. And then they even have lots of story, the overview of where you are. A big homage to Colossal Cave for this one. And setting this the, the scene for series of adventure games or series of video games. So much to unpack. Let's see what other artwork we have for this one. There is the front of the manual for the Scott Adams graphic adventure games. And there's a bunch of them. We're going to be seeing these, re these remakes popping up. This is the new and improved branding of it. And they even show you an example of drawing the map in the game and other hints. You can type help if you get stuck. There's there's a lot of um, quality of life things they did in this one compared to the original Adventureland. So it's it's really a, a remake. It's a remake of the original game with lots of other qu quality of life changes. Really cool. And then also in the box, we got the the warranty card. Whoa. And the five and a quarter floppy disk. I think it's two disks. Or is it double density? I think it's two discs that came in the box. The original one. Yeah, two discs. That's fantastic. All right, let's pop in and play some Adventureland, the new graphic adventure by Scott, Ed Scott Adams. Oh, that's true. You, you have to be old enough to type in and play the game. I guess if you, because you can have little kids with you and type with them. You know, a five-year-old could play, no problem, right? All right, so we want to play Run, Scott Adams graphic adventure. Okay, so show of hands, who wants to see the Scott Adams public service announcement again? I was going to skip it because we did it back when we messed up and played the wrong game. So here it is. Hi there. This is an open letter to all software users. If you wish to skip it, hit Z or else hit return. So you don't have to see this, but it is a 10 screen with gra high res graphics of Scott Adams just lambasting or telling everybody that do not copy your software ahead of its time, but uh, I wouldn't say it does like copy protection. <laughs> All right, here we go. We're hitting it. Hit return. There he is. I'm Scott Adams, president of Adventure International and author of the Adventure series. I want to chat about software pri uh, piracy for a moment, and then we'll get on with the main event. It is a cutscene about software piracy. The software you're, in, you're about to enjoy took considerable time, effort, and money to de devise. We're a large staff here at AI and many authors worldwide. <gasps> there they all are in high-res adventure. All these people and myself have one major thing in common. We all depend on Adventure International sales for our livelihood. If you were to give an, or accept a pirated copy of this program, please take a minute to think of the consequences. By the way, this game that we're playing on now is on a cracked or copy or pirated software. I mean, that's probably the reason we couldn't play the last one, because Scott Adams knew somehow we were playing a pirated copy. We set the price with the thought of many copies selling. If only a few sold, the price would be astronomical. If you give a friend a copy and he takes a friend a copy, etc., a sale of a single disc can turn into hundreds of bootleg copies. Pirating copies of software is the in stealing is in the end stealing from us here at Adventure International. Most people wouldn't steal from a store, so why steal from us? Trading bootleg copies doesn't stimulate software industry. It can only hurt everyone in the long run as less software becomes available. This is 1982. We're watching and experiencing this, and it's still a thing now, making sure people don't copy this stuff. So please, next time you're asked for a copy of copyrighted pr program, please say sorry, no. Don't say no. Say sorry, no. <laughs> they should give examples. You shouldn't copy software. Here's how you do it. And, but don't do this. Don't do this. Tell them you respect the efforts of free individuals in a free society to make an honest living. Tell them where to buy their own copy. <laughs> All this and more. Sorry to run on so much, but I really wanted to let you know my views on what I consider a serious problem facing our new fledgling industry. Please wait. 
So there you go. In its full, piracy is wrong. Don't copy that floppy. Thanks, Scott Adams. We're all learned individuals. So imagine in 1982, did it really make you not want to copy this whole... This is the best, by the way, of everything we've ever seen up to this point. We've seen it all here on Chronologically Gaming. To see some of someone make this up in 1982, it's fascinating. All right, so there you go. These are the new improvements to the Adventure Lane in graphic form. You can turn on and off lowercase. You can turn the voice on and off. And I'm not going to be doing it with playing the game with the voice because when I tried this, it just took way too long. The game would come up and then you would have to wait... Uh, like a minute or two with fast forwarding before the voice uh, played for me. So let's go ahead and flip that disc over and hit return. So we now go to disc two. And go. Oh, do you remember where the article was? Because that would be interesting to see if it has any simul sim similarities to this. I'm sure People Pong was pirated too. You can't play People Pong unless it was pirated. Do you want to restore a previously saved game? No, we do not. We want to play Adventureland. All right, so here we go. If you have the voice output, do it. But we are going to say no. There it is. The same intro that we've seen before. And then down at the bottom, like all the other Adventure uh, International games, it, the, it says it, the one flashing. Please don't copy or accept pirated copy. Now hit return. And there we go. The f the classic break between the top and bottom. A voice booms out. Welcome to adventure number one. Adventure land. In this adventure. You're to find treasures and store them away. To see how well you're doing, say score. Remember, you can always say help. Help. And there's the high-res graphics. Now, bear in mind, the high-res graphics we've seen on other graphic adventure games are actually lower quality than this. This is some of the best high-res graphic games. The only other one I can think of would be Cranston Manor on the Apple II. So this is the 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 best in graphic adventure uh, graphics. You can jump, climb, swim, find, take, score, drop, and other verbs you can think of. What shall I do? All right, let's look. And then when, when you do look in this one, it actually just shows you the graphics on the screen. Like, look, you can actually see what you're wanting to look at. Okay, so we're going to go south. And we move south. Nice. Anything here? No. Go south again. Nothing here. And if you played any Colossal Cave, you know that you, the idea is you're just trying to get to find the treasures in a certain place and then bring them back to a certain place to get your score. All right, well, south is not working. Let's go west. We are lost in the woods in 1982. Every time you type in, the screen goes from seeing what you did before. So you, every time you type, you can see what you, you, you did previously and then move forward after that. All right, so go back. Uh, let's go east then. No, I want to go north. And it's telling us all the exits we can have, which was helpful for text adventure games at the time. South. West. Good gosh, yeah, they just start you with nothing. And bear in mind, these are the kind of games that even if you made a map for them, they loop. So if you move west enough, you're gonna just move move around to the other side like a, a a very tiny world. So right now, if I'm moving west, I'm still just totally lost in the woods. Okay, you go south. Fine, I'll go north. So even if you were making the map, if you didn't know where the loop was or whenever it goes to the next screen, then you just continue on forever. <laughs> the World of Adventuring in 1982. Okay, fascinating. Thank you, Scott Adams. I uh, really appreciate it. Sorry. Had a lot of fun with your uh, game as we played it before. Now, of all the games we've seen up to this point, this is graphic adventure game. This is a game that is uh, incorporating a, a remake from something they had previously. So you can still play Adventureland and have the same experience that we did being lost in the woods. We usually only play a few tastes of adventure games here on the channel because in 1982, there was a lot of trial and error. There was a lot of frustration. There was a lot of why the hell is the computer not understanding what I'm saying? But um, for this one, 
I, I'm tempted to say this is above average video game uh, because of the features they've added and changed a, a few for the, the typical 1982 game. But it's still just the very similar. So it's it's still around the average range for so something you'd see in 1982. So uh, for Adventure Land, though, I'm gonna go be because of all the, the 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 features included. I'm gonna go three and a half stars for Adventure Land. If you were in 1982 and that's all you knew as far as computer games up to this point, I would say three and a half stars. And as always, chat can tell me. Uh, our star rating is always going to be one stars around the broken range. If you were stuck in 1982, where we are, would you say the game's broken? Two stars is the game is the game bad. Three stars is the game average or sub average. And then three and a half would be above average. Four stars, would you consider the game to be a good game or a very good game? And then if you get in the five star range, is this one of the best games you could play in 1982? So as always, love to hear the chat come in. Give me all the stuff that you say. Is the game terrible or? This is a, a piece of hot dumpster fire. I wouldn't play this or use it as a coaster. Oh, way before. Wow. So maybe he was one of the pioneers of piracy or DRM if you made the article that early. That's crazy. All right, so that's where we're going to be putting our video game playing on pause this evening. Great evening. Thanks so much, everyone, for joining me, especially on a uh, usual hol holiday. Uh, we're going to be continuing April in 1982. Got some really, really, really good games for 1982 coming up. Surprising ones, unless you've looked ahead. If you know your history, you, you kind of know what ex it's what's expected. But I'll leave you on your toes until then. Uh, that's it for today. And like I always say, it doesn't have to be a brand new game to have a great time. Hey, everybody. Thanks for checking out the channel and joining me on my quest to play every single video game in order of release. We'll be streaming live every weekday at 9 p.m. Central. So join us and let us know if we missed any games along the way. This video would not be possible without LaunchBox, RetroArch, and MAME. Tell all your friends there's some crazy guy named Chronologically Gaming trying to play every single video game. We have links down below that'll send you to places like our Discord and Patreon, and one that says all the video games we've ever played. If you go there, it's a list of everything, and you can click right to the game you want to see. Chronologically Gaming is the name to look for. We are Perpetually Retro, and we will catch you next time.